so much. Thanks, Nava. Hi, thank you. So, um, an aspect of my work that wasn't highlighted in that bio, but you might infer from what I talk about today is that I've worked primarily with Japanese artists and Japanese media. And so today I will be talking a little bit more about Japanese history and Japan their, the Japanese obsession with lacquer and not so much about, um, I, I, would, I do want to talk about these pieces, but I'll mostly be talking about what I know, which is Japan and how we consume things. Um, so let me start with what I've actually pulled out from the collection. Um, this is a lacquer coated wooden bowl um, by Giles, whose last name Gilson. And there's an amazing piece by him actually downstairs in the center of the gallery. Uh, I'm not going to remember the full name because it's like three lines long, but it's like Relationships 3, Spaceships, and something yes. alluding to movies. Anyway, it's really cool. But what I think is so interesting about uh, lacquer work, just generally, is that this is, you know, it's kind of like nose to tail cuisine when you take every part of the animal. So with uh, lacquered wood art, you're taking sap out of the wood and manipulating it to treat the, the tree that creates the wood that's the base of the work. So it's sort of the nose to tail of wood art, I would argue, because you're you're taking the sap and the wood and and in Japanese lacquer where you're also representing the wood or the trees and the leaves and the and the flowers that bloom from it on the on the piece itself so it's like multiple layers no pun intended of meaning um, the specific kind of lacquerware that I thought was really worth looking at and that th there happens to be these amazing catalogs in the center's collection of, um, th these are just catalogs of wajima nuri, and wajima lacquerware is a really, it's a specific kind of lacquerware based in the place that it comes from, which is called wajima. So be patient with me as I walk you through a little bit of the Japanese geography and history. Um, so if you're looking at, how many of you have been to Japan by any chance? Okay, so. Yeah, um, if you're in Tokyo today, if you took a bullet train three hours uh, northwest, you would end up in Ishikawa Prefecture. Ishikawa Prefecture is really famous for its phenomenal rice crop, its salt, and its lacquerware, actually. So I think it's really interesting already that these natural products have become so popular, and the byproducts of those things are uh, miso because of rice koji with fermenting salt and rice and sake and these are rice miso and sake are all things that require vessels to consume uh, you can't just eat it with your well you could eat it with your hands but you know what I mean like w they have to be contained historically and cult and popularly in Japan all these vessels are preferably made out of soft materials and never metal and things like, um, uh, you know, well, so in a weird way that makes plastic very acceptable in Japanese cuisine, but you know, it's preferably wood and lacquerware or mm. some kind of earthenware or some kind of uh, plastic or, and, and, and glass, but never metal. That's always really important. So silverware was really weird to a lot of Japanese for a long time. And a lot of that has to do with just the relationship you have with food. When you're touching the vessel, you want it to translate the food that you're eating um, as accurately as possible. So, uh, you know, a, wood, a wooden bowl containing food or a, a wooden cup filled with sake communicates the, the place that the food came from more accurately than, say, uh, metal or glass. And the same is to be said of chopsticks. So, you know, in Japan, wooden chopsticks are an art form of itself. And um, wajima nuri specifically is so coveted that today, if you were to find a really beautiful piece of it, even if it 
you know, by our appearances, it would just look like a typical bento box, um, would actually cost at least four figures. And that's because the Wajima Nuri process has, is at least, there's at least 50 steps. It's, it takes a year just to dry the wood correctly. And then it takes, I mean, it's just so hard to get, I don't know the craftsman details of the process, but I do know it's a very elaborate and complicated process that requires, you know, a room with no dust, which is like impossible. And, um, and then just the, like the skilled labor where in Japan, uh, an apprentice doesn't really graduate into their intermediate even level of expertise until they've been through 10 years of sweeping the floors, right? So uh, by those standards, even a little lunch, lacquer lunchbox deservedly will end up costing four or five figures. And that's why uh, the hoi poloi, like me, when we visit places like Wajima, can only afford to buy the chopsticks. <laughs> Uh, but this is a really great kind of vehicle or a, it's a nice way f and a nice sort of sub market for these kinds of uh, luxury items. So if you've ever been to Tiffany's and bought the keychain or if you've ever gone to Fendi and bought the socks, it's the same idea, right? You just you can't afford the dress. So you get the socks. Um, I'm actually going to pass these around because I think it's really interesting. These are chopsticks that have only been lacquered once, and these are chopsticks that have been lacquered completely. And it's made of the same hinoki wood base, but just I just want everybody to kind of feel it. And I know it's kind of weird, but they're clean if you want to like even just kind of rub it on your mouth so you know, you know how important it is for food to feel a certain way when you use a utensil as soft and luxurious and delicate and smooth as lacquerware. What is the hinoki wood? Hinoki is cypress. So hinoki is a wood that's really popular right now. If you go to any sort of like upper end bath shop, uh, there's a lot of like hinoki cypress or hinoki cedar, or it's cypress, but sometimes it's referred to cedar because it smells similarly. I wish I knew more about trees, especially in Philadelphia, because all the streets are named after trees. Um, I couldn't. I probably could not identify the difference between a pine and a spruce, but anyway. Um, if anybody does know more about trees, come see me after the talk. <laughs> um, I also want to hand around these, cat w they're allowed to peruse the catalogs, correct? Okay, so just if you want to look at what this work looks like in its, um, in its, in its final form. Um, you know, it's really beautiful. So on a completely different note, just kind of calling attention back to this particular object, the wooden bowl. Nava pointed out something really interesting when I was looking at Giles' piece downstairs, but um, I guess there's a, there's some kind, there's a room for criticism, there's a space for a criticism of wood art that hides or obscures the grain. And that's another reason why I find Japanese lacquerware so fascinating is because the, um, how funny would it be if I ate with white gloves though? <laughs> <laughs> um, Japanese lacquerware and uh, is, is, is really judged by how effectively it has obscured the entirety of the original wood product, right? So you're not supposed to see the base and it's supposed to resemble water and the black lacquer aspect of it is to suggest a sort of infinity so you're looking at a really deep pool and it and you know we have to remember at this point japan's an archipelago surrounded by water the oceans are very dark um so i just want to think about that for a second so 
If we're back in Wajima, where this lacquer technique originated and where it's still practiced actively by a lot of artisans, um, this little town exists at the base of a peninsula on the Sea of Japan, coast of Japan. And it's an unusual sort of topography because it is surrounded by water, but it's also, it's close enough to China and Korea that you can actually get on a small boat. And I mean, it'd be a hard ride, but you can actually sort of do that. Um, so it's sort of big and small at the same time. And that peninsula feels very isolated and, and yet it's still obviously connected to the rest of the main, uh, well not obviously, but to me it's obviously connected to the rest of the main island. And if any of you get a chance to go to this peninsula, it's called the Noto Peninsula, but it is like walking into a time capsule of a Japan that disappeared at least 50 years ago. Nothing has changed since the 60s, um, and I would argue even a lot of the traditions have not changed since long before that. I think cars are the newest thing that they've seen in this area. But the fishing techniques, the rice uh, farming techniques, uh, a lot of those traditional techniques continue to be used um, in, the, in the locale. And um, one of the more fascinating, or the, one of the more enjoyable techniques to um, experience is the sake <laughs> making technique. Um, some of the few remaining sake distilleries that still use that full process, which is much more time consuming than the me mechanized process, are practiced on this peninsula and in this region. So that's just a little tourist sort of plug for that region if you ever do get to go out there. Again, from Tokyo, it's a three hour bullet train to Kanazawa where there's a beautiful Kanazawa Museum of Art designed by the architect Sana, and then the nearby peninsula. Oh, and it's one of the only parts of the world where you can drive a car on the beach. So, you know, it's like right on the sand. It's really cool. I did it once and got a speeding ticket. Um, <laughs> But it's so it's such an arcane culture, just a subculture that my speeding ticket was uh, awarded me <laughs> by a policeman who actually jumped out in front of my car about 500 yards from me with a big cloth sign that said stop. So like that's that's how I hate to use this word, but primitive some of that culture is and. And why, why we're so lucky to still be able to experience this uh, traditional craft. Um, How far back does lacquer go in history? So the myth is that it goes back to millennia, or what, where the Japanese start tracking modern history. And the Jomon period is that sort of, you know, Jomon in Japan is shorthand for cavemen, but you know, so it's not quite a million years, but it's sort of when they decided to call Japan a, a culture. So two millennia. And I think there are other stories about how it came, the practice came from the continental Asia. So even, you know, longer before that, but I guess there are, cert there are different origin stories and I'm not really familiar with all of them, but in terms of the culture of it, it's, you know, um, it's regarded as dating back about two millennia. The fetishization of it, I should add, interestingly, comes from contact with Europe, who, and not because it was Europeans who liked it per se, but because they were, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They were communicating um, the Japanese artifacts back to the mainland. So, Chinese influence on Japanese culture is really obvious and, and very present. The return of the Japanese artifacts to the Chinese culture are less obvious, but the Portuguese did a really great job of that. Um, so this is really interesting, but the Portuguese were the first, ostensibly the first Europeans to interact with Japan in the 16th century, and that was through Jesuit missionaries. Um, and 
fast forward to, so this is like 1543. This is like a really remarkable year in Japanese religious history because by six, around a hundred years after that is when Japan said, no more Christianity, no more Westerners, get out, and the Edo period officially begins, which is this famous era of closed borders, uh, isolationism, and we don't see the Japanese again until the Meiji period in um, almost uh, almost 1900, so like 1860-something. Um, I'm so impressed with myself remembering all of these <laughs> dates. Um, I've definitely taken all of my Japanese history classes, but I can't believe I remembered all of that. Um, but just to say that you know, the influence of the Portuguese, while it was really uh, divisive and internecine because of the religious back, the, the context of it being Jesuit missionaries, um, their coming into Japan is a really critical part of why so much of Japanese um, ornamentation and culture has been so celebrated and vaunted by the rest of the world. Um, I'd argue that there are a lot of Japanese aspects, there's a lot of aspects of Japanese culture that are even today very uh, fetishized and that practice of sort of the fetish, and I don't mean that in a modern sense, but just in terms of you know, the, the, the trinket or the fetish, um, this isn't Japanese, but it looks so small, I just had to use that as a visual reference, um, does really start with uh, the Portuguese. So if you look at Japanese language, for example, a lot of the loan words for, um, they, they have a lot of loan words from the Portuguese, and this is unrelated to wood and lacquer now, but just some trivia, but um, like, uh, Arigato in J Japanese comes from obrigado in Portuguese. Um, tempura is actually a Portuguese word, and it refers to temp. I, I'm not going to know the exact Portuguese word for it, but it's the Latinate of tempere. So the duration it takes to fry the food, it has nothing to do with the fry, but timing it correctly. But um, like oil, frying in oil is a Portuguese concept. Uh, no shade, <laughs> but that wasn't part of the Japanese culinary language until the Portuguese. Um, what else is from Portugal? There's just a lot of Portuguese influence in, in the way the Japanese talk about their own artifacts. Anyway, so they just became so fascinated with the lacquerware that that then um, promulgated more sort of um, fetishization of that practice, which then, you know, allowed it to become valuable. And it was already becoming valuable, but that just kind of boosted it. Um, so by the Edo period, now in its isolated cultural state, Japan is now creating these um, really extravagant pieces of lacquerware that you can see in those catalogs. Um, yeah, I think that's sort of, I'm trying to remember what else I wanted to share about that. I think for me the most fascinating part is this element of, you know, uh, lacquerware being the the thing between you and food, right? I, I find that really fascinating um, and how the Japanese think about what is considered appropriate. Um, there are a lot of ceremonial aspects to Japanese consumption of whether it's tea ceremony or um, sake or the way food is presented on a platter. It, there, it's all very ceremonial. And a lot of that is just distilled from, you know, the courtesans, or sorry, the the aristocratic caste. But you know, um, that th those are the those are the consumption memories that we continue to uphold as a people today. And um, and I just think that's really fascinating. Um, I would even argue that might lend itself to why. The Japanese have been able to explore so much in plastic because it is very similar to plastic and other kinds of artificial shellac. Um, J Japan being one of the major manufacturers and designers of um, new new forms of synthetic uh, shellac and plastic, which I, th I would argue kind of mimics the look and feel of lacquer. Um, any questions? Yeah. The, the artisans that, that, that were doing that, um, where, where did they rank in, in the 
the social hierarchy and could they afford lacquer in their home? I think they'd be classed as merchants, merchant class, so somewhere under the samurai but above the farmer. So um, I don't know, unfortunately I don't know enough about caste history, but a, a craftsman and a merchant would be at the sort of similar level. I don't know, that's a good question. I'm not sure if they could afford their own wares. I'm, yeah, I just don't know. I actually had a question about the technique of lacquer. Um, I don't know if you can talk a little bit about how, how it actually works or how it comes together. And how My understanding of it is a lot of it is the, speaking of tempura, the timing. <laughs> so um, I don't actually know the sort of how to get, you know, a piece of wood to look like this, but um, the, what makes it so incredibly difficult in the first stages is the preparation of the materials. Um, I just read in here, actually, I, and so I don't pretend to be an expert, but I did just happen to read in here that um, what makes Waji Manuri so unique is the lacquer that comes from the, the tree sap in that region of Japan actually has a higher level of a certain kind of chemical substance that makes it harder so when it dries it gets much harder um, so its oil to water ratio is very strong on oil but to get that to work effectively it needs to be dried a really specific way or it has to be prepared in a really unique way um, I know that the wood bowl itself so there are two different there are two different craftsmen there's the person who is lathing the bowl and then the person who's treating it with lacquer um, and I do know that much and I would I don't know but I would guess that the person who ornaments it with the gold inlays and the mother of pearl and things like that is also another person I'm guessing I don't know but that would be my guess Are there any parallels with uh, glazes the ceramic mm. glazes that artisans sometimes both. That's such a great question, and I don't know what the timelines look like in next to each other, but glaze glaze came later for sure, um, and pottery and ceramic wear and glaze uh, and glaze. I don't know when that happened, but I'm. That's a good question. I I would love to find that out myself. I'm interested to know about the development of imagery. Mm. Um, Mm -hmm. that is also parallel to the development of cloisonne as a, yeah. as a vitreous enamel technique. Yeah, I think a lot of it has, well, so another element of design is, you know, so when the, when the, at, at the heyday of this technique and when the Portuguese started to uh, have, when the Portuguese intervention start, started to happen, this is right around the beginning of the Japanese unification which meant right before the unification, there were so many fiefdoms that were in combat with each other, and that period is generally referred to as the, um, well, there's the warring states and then the Muromachi, but this is a really competitive period between the different fiefdoms. So it was about classifying each fief. So it's like sports paraphernalia where, um, or even gang paraphernalia, if you're a blood, you never wear blue. So it was, I mean, it was at that level that the iconography w would manifest in different regions. So I don't know the exact taxonomy, but for example, if you were a maple leaf, you never depicted a cherry blossom or, you know, that it was at that level. And I would guess that just in their silos, those elements of decoration probably developed in their own sort of way. But I know the reason it became so much more decorative later was with the, with the um, in the caste system, with the aristocracy sort of um, having full control of, you know, the, of the government. And I don't think they would have called it that at that point, but um, it, just, it was just a very ornate period leading up to the Edo and then the Edo. Yeah, which was just so bohemian, yeah. I think too, I'm sure the European influence also informed sort of what um, 
did become popularized. I'm, I might be getting this, don't quote me on this, but I do know that um, inlay artwork sort of was highly coveted by the Portuguese, but I don't know if that was then a specific market that was created for them. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if the Japanese then started making stuff specifically for the Portuguese, but I do know that was something the Portuguese really liked. So I'm sure that contributed to developing that, yeah. Cool. Uh, well, thanks for listening to me. Thank you.